For the departing British, this was not a retreat, but a proud march homewards. Now, said Governor Patton, it was time for Hong Kong people to seize their own future. It has been the greatest honour and privilege of my life to share your home for five years and to have some responsibility for your future. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. Kill them, OJ! Are you sorry you killed them now? Are you sorry you killed them, OJ? We have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident and that her partner, Dodie Fired, has also been killed. They were apparently being pursued by paparazzi on two motorcycles. Elton John sings Candle in the Wind with new words specially written a few days ago by Bernie Taupin. Goodbye, Blooms Rose. May you ever grow in our hearts. You are the grace that placed yourselves where lives were torn apart. Oh. At that one. At that bike. Now here's the bike. Keep, keep your eye on Mike. See, Mike has just see, look at him. You can see it. You can see it. There it is. More fighting in the ring after the end of the fight. Tyson's trying to get at Holyfield again, I believe. Let me see you just bouncing with me. Just bounce with me. Just bouncing with me. Come on, let me see you just slide with me. Just slide with me. Just slide with me. Come on, let me see you take a walk with me. Just walk it with me. Take a walk with me. Come on, let me get that work. Now freeze. This is what you get when you mess with us. We are a great country. The British people are a great people. There is no greater honor than to serve them, and serve them we will. Thank you. Darth Blair came to power in the UK in 1997. Along with Crichton-esque hand gestures and a terrifying smile that made him look like the Grinch after 10 milligrams of diamorphine, he brought with him an unshakable faith in free markets and globalization. Despite the landslide election result and the huge amount of optimism about the transition to a left-wing Labour government after 18 years of Tory rule, Blair's government didn't enact any great sweeping changes in policy. He stuck closely to the new economic settlement established by Margaret Thatcher's government back in the late 70s, early 80s. And as we approached the new millennium, the results of these policies were coming into full view. From a kid's perspective, I remember it being a fairly rapid shift. By the early 2000s, a coffee cost a ludicrous sum of three pounds. Everyone went from owning tatty old second-hand cars to sleek, metallic brand new ones. Poor people started slapping gigantic TVs and holidays to Goa on their readily available credit cards. TV adverts got ever more slick and incomprehensible. LCD displays with truly terrible image quality became the de facto standard. House prices rocketed up, wages stagnated, and meanwhile sleek Elysian city centres emerged. A nucleus of monolithic mixed-use retail glass and steel encircled by fire rings of relative poverty in the inner city residential areas. It's the great contradiction. In the 80s and the early 90s, the music culture of Manchester turned a dead city centre into a vibrant city centre. So much so that in the late 90s and now, people are flocking to live in that vibrant city centre. The only thing is, they want to get rid of the vibes. Look at this block, loads of apartments and flats. This building should be saying, look at the new Manchester. Instead, it's saying, turn that music down. Inevitably, pop culture reflected this shift. In 97, Radiohead released OK Computer, a highly significant and highly awesome record. My first serious, inverted commas, CD single was Paranoid Android by Radiohead. That cassette copy of Real Things by Two Unlimited I bought when I was 10 doesn't count. In fact, it never actually happened. 
Paranoid Android was the lead single from the album. It was and is a modern indie rock opera masterpiece, and I was completely swept away by it. Looking back now at the white, shiny, minimal artwork, cardboard sleeves, and the sparse, sparkling sound of Nigel Godrich's production, it occurs to me that this was and remains a thoroughly modern record. It seemed to reflect many of the changes I was seeing all around me at the time, the perfect accompaniment to the rising tide of white, shiny consumer electronics, uniform glass and steel airports and city centres, ubiquitous, impossibly sleek mobile phones, and the anomie of an increasingly fragmented, high-speed internet-dependent population. Around this time we also saw a similar aesthetic shift in records by the likes of Bjork, Spiritualized, Super Furry Animals, U2, and of course, Hansen. The shift was also reflected in the world of video games, and in the late 90s we saw a pretty rapid shift from what I'm going to call the high watermark of the old, and the beginning of the new. The late 90s gave us big budget, technologically and creatively ambitious point and click games on the PC, the apogee of 2D sprite based games rallying against the coming tsunami of 3D polygons. Nintendo introduced us to entirely new dimensions, revolutionary camera systems and control schemes. Sega treated us to military grade, technologically ludicrous arcade hardware and games, while simultaneously developing some of the most ambitious, astounding and hopelessly quixotic home console games of all time. Square harnessed the possibilities presented by the high capacity CD format and fully established JRPG's presence in western markets. 3DFX triumphed over the frontier era of PC 3D accelerated cards and their Voodoo chipsets provided a huge leap in graphical fidelity in what was effectively the birth of the modern graphics card. And more importantly, Chumbawamba released Tub Thumping. It was something of a Wild West Gold Rush era for gaming, when 3D polygon games were solidifying their position as the de facto standard. Many of the paradigms established around this time still exist with us today, and we were also treated to some strange and wonderful detours down technological cul-de-sacs that remain unique, bizarre, and fascinating to this day. It's probably impossible to communicate how exciting and fresh this era was to people who weren't kids at that particular point in time, but being the glutton for punishment I am, I'm going to give it my best shot. This is a high-end 1997 PC. A Dell Optiplex GXA equipped with a Pentium 200 MMX. What a beast. Now much to my wife's completely justifiable chagrin, I got hopelessly hooked on the idea of getting an idealized version of the PC I had back in the day. It's slightly more powerful than the one I had back then, but essentially the spec is more or less the same. I bought the base system on eBay and it arrived in really good condition except it was quite yellowed. Needless to say, that wasn't good enough for me. I'm reluctant to put it outside in the non-existent UK sunshine. Is there no sun in this cursed country? I decided to use vinyl dye, and the result is pretty pleasing, I think. But I digress. The key ingredient of this laughably obsolete retro goulash is the awkward Righteous 3D 3DFX graphics accelerator. The 3DFX Voodoo was a huge leap for 3D graphics as a whole, and arguably it was the birth of the modern GPU. Released at the very tail end of 96, the card came to full bloom in 97. At the risk of talking in cliches, it was a watershed moment in real-time 3D graphics. 
It was developed, of course, by the 3DFX company, a Californian startup trying to make their fortune in the home 3D graphics market. The company was founded in spring 94, and of all the chefs in the early 3D accelerator kitchen, they became the dominant force. In a side note, three of the most prominent engineers, Scott Sellers, Ross Smith, and Gary Taroli, came from Silicon Graphics, the company responsible for the workstations upon which the CG of many a big-budget Hollywood movie was produced. In March of 96, 15 titles with Voodoo support debuted at E3, and the audience was stunned by wholly new levels of visual quality. From the ground up, 3DFX planned to build a high-end 3D gaming board capable of delivering smooth gameplay at 640x480 resolution with bilinear filtered textures, and it delivered in spades. using technology to save the planet. Our tiny chip, it does 100 billion operations per second. That is power most awesome. And we are using it to make a difference. Imagine clean air, pure water, and a new future. I wish my family back home could see me now. And we are most proud knowing that we are doing our part to help save the planet. Attention everybody, we're going to forget that environment stuff and uh, use a chip for computer games. Back to work. <clears throat> Three D effects, PC accelerators. So powerful, it's kind of ridiculous. Blast his freaking head off! possession a chip a chip that could revolutionize medicine as we know it by performing over a hundred billion operations a second this chip could help us heal across continents we could touch more lives help people live longer than ever and give us all more time to cherish the journey's truest rewards. But then we thought, hey, let's use it for games. <laughs> 3DFX PC accelerators, so powerful, it's kind of ridiculous. My big brother bought one of these cards back home from the little IT company he worked for as a young lad. 
To be honest, I didn't quite understand what he was on about at first, as he stood there waving this pea green pop tart of expensive silicon in my face while struggling to explain what it could do for our 3D gaming needs. But he slapped it into the PC regardless, remembering to first connect the VGA output of the PC's discrete 2D graphics card into the Voodoo, inserted the installation disc, we were greeted with the awesome click of the physical relay switch when the Voodoo card was engaged, and... This was absolutely stunning stuff back in the day. We were accustomed to the wobbly, rum and mosaic 3D graphics and Lego-esque unfiltered textures of the PlayStation and Sega Saturn at the time. And this was a huge jump up. To put it into perspective, the N64 was considered cutting edge in 97, and the 3D effects cut through it like warm tofu. Upon its release, the raw power of the Voodoo was so shockingly awesome and so far ahead of the competition that it was hard to imagine a need for something more powerful in the future. What wallies we were. You wally! <laughs> One game in particular that left a big impression on me at the time, especially considering I'd already played and loved the original release of the game on Sega Saturn, was the PC version of the original Tomb Raider. What makes you sweat? Is it passion? Or could it just be heat? What about not knowing if your very next breath will be your last? What about all three? Tomb Raider. From IDOS Interactive. A solid gold classic, in my opinion, and an important touchstone in the history of 3D gaming that gave us beautiful animations, an incredibly ominous and intimate atmosphere, an innovative lock-on system, and a revolutionary 3D camera. But I digress again, with the Voodoo card engaged, Tomb Raider went from looking like this, to looking like this. My little Bart Simpson socks were blown clear across the room. The Star Wars franchise had been largely dormant for some years, and it returned in a big way in 97, and I was completely swept along with it. For an entire generation, people have experienced Star Wars the only way it's been possible on the TV screen. But if you've only seen it this way, you haven't seen it at all. Now, for its 20th anniversary, the adventure of a lifetime returns to the big screen in a way you've never seen before. There'll be no one to stop us this time. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. With newly enhanced visual effects. They're coming in too fast! THX and digital sound. And a few new surprises. Hanabuki. Bardonianda. On President's Day weekend, 1997, George Lucas and 20th Century Fox invite you to welcome back Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, Darth Vader, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, C-3PO, and R2-D2. Finally, the motion picture event, the way it was meant to be experienced. This will be a day long remembered. As the entire Star Wars trilogy returns. On February 14th, Star Wars, followed soon after by The Empire Strikes Back, and then Return of the Jedi. Move closer! For a whole new generation who have yet to experience it on the big screen. And for everyone else to experience it again. That boy is our last hope. No, there is another. The Star Wars Trilogy, Special Edition. See it again for the first time. 
force will be with you, always. I was born in 84, so I missed the original wave of Star Wars. Everything was Ghostbusters and Turtles when I was a little tyke. But my older brother, born in 78, himself slightly too young for it, brought the VHS tapes home with him one afternoon and introduced me to the series. I remember being utterly confused that the first film was just called Star Wars, and yet the trilogy was also called Star Wars, and I spent about three hours trying to get a satisfactory explanation from him. Needless to say, a long, futile argument with lots of shouting ensued, ending with me ripping his boggling in half in a fit of apoplectic rage. I'll have to buy him a new one one of these days. George Lucas was trying to re-establish the Star Wars brand for a new generation, and he brought both the Star Wars Special Editions and the Shadows of the Empire franchise to the table, along with new waves of action figures and some truly awesome PC games. One of these was X-Wing vs TIE Fighter. Captain, Rebel Starfighters are entering the area. Very well, Commander. Launch Adventure Squadron. Alright, bro. Let's get those fighters. Like the Amiga before it, there was something exotic and unobtainable about high-end PC gaming. I think that something was the vast amounts of cash they cost to buy. Our new PC had opened whole new genres to me, and the prospect of playing an ocean-deep, technologically advanced game set in the Star Wars universe had me practically soiling myself with excitement. Despite the fact that it was a pretty amazing spectacle for his day, but to a 13-year-old me, it felt like what piloting an X-Wing might actually be like with a cockpit stuffed with switches and dials and throttle controls and S-foils and beverage holders and whatever else. A lot of people, myself included, were a bit disappointed by the fact that this was an online multiplayer game and lacked anything much for the solo player. Don't get excited! In stepped a Star Wars X-Wing vs TIE Fighter Balance of Power, an expansion pack that added a fairly substantial single player campaign mode for both Rebels and Imperials and it added support for the fabled 3DFX Voodoo 3D Accelerator. I love this game and its sequel, X-Wing Alliance, even though it was and remains as hard as an old goat's balls. I am absolutely shite at these games, even now, and yet I can't stop playing them. Four. Order acknowledged. Using your target for attack. This is four. Order acknowledged. Using your target for attack. Two other PC games, both released in 97, are great examples of what this era is all about. They are MDK and Interstate 76. Thank you. 
One is a vehicular combat game set in a post-apocalyptic alternate 1970s with a highly distinctive low polygon aesthetic. The other one is a third person action game set uh, in... well, MDK is just MDK. Both are absolutely singular visions. Their art design, music, and respective oddball vibes are absolutely uncompromised. They both play extremely well today, and their graphics hold up a great deal better than games many years more recent, in my opinion. This is due largely to their highly stylized aesthetics. The developers embraced the limitations of the real-time 3D available to them at the time in a carefully considered and skillful manner. Okay, baby, here's the school. You got to get used to a whole new kind of driving. See, this car's been modified. You try to stick with me, okay? Yeah, I got it. Do it back. Open. Pick your shot. Watch the civilian. Watch my ass. Let's get out of here. I struggle to think of many modern games that can whisk us away to strange new worlds with such swagger and self-confidence. They're both the work of smallish teams, of highly creative, inspired developers with a decent sized budget, and the opportunity to make absolutely what they wanted to make. And they're both funny as fuck too. Blueberry. Thanks. Are you ready? I'm not gonna play this game. I've never killed anyone, Taurus. This place is a stinking mess. But who the hell you think's gonna clean up around here if we don't? Well, who did this to her? I don't know, man. The same damn fool's been tearing shit up around here. Pigs don't do shit. They're probably in on it. 97 also saw the release of Curse of Monkey Island, a spectacularly drawn and animated point-and-click adventure. Captain's Log, Guybrush Threepwood. I've got to get out of here and help Elaine. If I could only get through this one door. Well, then I could easily overpower the armed guards above, slip over the side, and make for the shore. Quit your mumbling, captive! The Incredible Blade Runner and The Last Express saw traditional point and clicks fighting bravely, if futilely, against the oncoming tidal wave of 3D polygon based games. And in retrospect, they really were the death rattle of big budget 
mainstream point and click adventures. All three in their own way is a stone cold classics in my opinion. In particular Blade Runner to deploy a slab of typical 90s UK games journalism twaddle had me cacking my pants with excitement ever since I picked up a 97 issue of PC Zone magazine and saw this trailer. Indulge me. The fantastic Grim Fandango came out in 98, and people are still making point and clicks today of course, but I'd argue that 97 was the crescendo of mainstream traditional point and clicks. So if the late 90s was the start of the new, it was also the high watermark of the old. In the UK the Nintendo 64 was finally released in May 97, after years of monolithic hype. Anyone remember the fabled Ultra 64? All the talk of SGI silicon graphics workstations and comparisons with Toy Story had us all very excited, and although the console ultimately found somewhat limited success, it certainly gifted us a handful of all-time greats. Although she says she has no memory of it whatsoever, and like the replicants of Blade Runner, it might well be an artificial memory implant. I swear to god that my sister made a really cool Mario cake for my birthday that year, in honour of one of the greatest birthday presents ever, an N64 and a copy of Super Mario 64. Nintendo 64 is here. Get into it. Although many aspects of its visuals and mechanics are dated, most notably the camera system, this game was one of the first to really codify movement, control, and navigation in a 3D space. In fairness, I would argue that the original Tomb Raider was almost as successful in this venture. Anyway, Mario 64 was a spectacular, joyous video game from beginning to end, and it remains so today. Even though these days, the camera does send me fucking bananas, and when I finally got stuck into the game proper, I was completely besotted with it.
The highest grossing arcade game of 97, in Japan at least, was Virtua Fighter 3. Although technically speaking, it was released in the second half of 96, it stood peerless throughout 97 and beyond, as the pinnacle of real-time 3D graphics. If any of you are familiar with the kind of images you were getting from your PS1 or Saturn at this time, you win. Just imagine how amazing this tech demo looked to observers at E3 96. Right from the early 1970s, arcades have been at the forefront of graphical technology in video games, and the Sega Model 3 can be seen as the ultimate product of the arcade hardware arms race that had run for 25 years or so. Upon release, it was more powerful than any other arcade platform on the market, as well as any home console or computer. In fact, it took several years for home systems to fully catch up. The Model 3 was effectively military-grade hardware, developed in collaboration with Lockheed Martin, no less, and each cabinet cost upwards of $15,000. It was absolutely spectacular. I remember seeing the game, along with the amusingly titled Scud Race, in a big arcade in Blackpool in the northwest of England back in 97, and being knocked silly by its absolutely ludicrous real-time graphics, which to me at the time equaled the pre-rendered CG cutscenes of many home console games. In something of a running theme for this video, hence the title, the Model 3 was also in some ways the end of an era. An era in which insane amounts of money was spent on creating unique and ridiculously powerful and expensive hardware. Sega would follow up the Model 3 with the more budget conscious Sega Naomi, and as a general rule that pattern would continue for many years as arcade systems and home consoles moved away from costly, bespoke hardware towards adapted, off-the-shelf inverted commas, PC components, and more modest and cost-effective hardware overall. Today, in many ways consoles and arcade machines are essentially slightly modified PCs in very nice looking cases. Another elephantine multimedia project released in 97 was of course this.
I have to admit, by this point, I'd actually sold my PlayStation and bought a Sega Saturn. So to be honest, I didn't actually play the game upon its release, but I certainly do remember the enormous hype for it. I read many of the previews and showcases that littered the multi-format gaming magazines back in those days, and I'll admit that I was a bit jealous of the kids at school who were foaming at the mouth with excitement about it. The idea of JRPGs intrigued me, but I just hadn't played any, except for a quick rental of Shining Force 2 on the Mega Drive, and my only real memory of that was just not really knowing what the fuck I was supposed to do. But I digress again. I got to play Final Fantasy VII the following year when the PC version came out. It never quite landed with me in the same way as a lot of those legendary late 90s games, but I completely understand why a lot of people absolutely adore this game. The quality of the pre-rendered scenes was absolutely spectacular, as was the way real-time 3D models were seamlessly placed upon them. The anime sci-fi art design was cool as fuck, and the oddly intimate and even somewhat melancholy feel of the game is truly unique. It was another milestone in Western pop culture for 97, the point where JRPGs, along with stylized anime aesthetics in general, really ingratiated themselves with Western consumers. Neo Tokyo is about to explode. <laughs> Japanese aesthetics and pop culture made major inroads into the Western mainstream around this time. Early anime breakthrough movies like Akira had recently been joined by the mesmerizing ghost in the shell. People love machines in 2029 AD. But it was perhaps the invasion of Pokemon that made the deepest impact. Pokemon is now in full mania. Here's ABC's Tom Foreman. <laughs> At Greenwood Elementary School, lunchtime is trading time, and the cards are flying. I'll trade you this for a guy rid of that for my girl. That's crazy. If it sounds like the kids are speaking another language, they are the language of Pokemon. Pokemon, short for Pocket Monsters, was born four years ago as a Japanese video game. The star is Pikachu, who does lighthearted battle with 150 other characters in the number one TV show, the number one video game, and most of all in the popular trading cards. But what Pikachu and his pals do just as well is sell. They will earn over a billion dollars this year. Christina Levy yep. spent $1,000 last month on Pokemon. Her kids call her Pokemon. It's a really social game, socially interacts with all the kids in the neighborhood. So as opposed to sitting in front of a television watching cartoons, he's interacting with kids. So I really am a fan of the game. Such enthusiasm has driven the stock of one toy maker up 50% and prompted a string of new products. It is going into a lot of areas of activity that children are interested in. And that's why it's becoming so ingrained in our culture. Back at Greenwood Elementary School today, the principal joined a list of educators banning Pokemon because the card trading is so competitive and consuming. I don't have anything against them. I just don't want them to, you know, distract us from what our job here is. And others may follow suit when a new Pokemon movie hits theaters this fall, spurring even more Pokemania. Tom Foreman, ABC News, Denver. Its anime aesthetic had a direct and quantifiable effect on Western pop culture, particularly on kids' TV shows and toys. Today, when I watch kids' TV or play games on the tablet with my little girl, I often see a distinct anime-infused style that simply wasn't present when I was a little kid. 
kawaii vibe is well and truly ingrained in our culture now, but it wasn't always this way. Ninety-eight saw the release of three games in particular that for me represented the sort of apex of the old that I've been flailing around ineffectually trying to define for the past half an hour. They're games the likes of which we probably won't see again, the product of a uniquely favourable set of circumstances that no longer exist. They were Zelda Ocarina of Time and Panzer Dragoon Saga. I would also argue, although it wasn't ultimately released until 99, that Shenmue belongs in this bracket too, having started life as a Sega Saturn game back in the late 90s. All of them are truly monolithic projects, highly ambitious, with high profiles and an awful lot riding on their success. And yet, all three are full of the kind of obsessive and idiosyncratic touches that are the hallmark of a tightly knit, highly creative, relatively small development team by today's standards, determined to make what they wanted to make. All three game worlds are absolutely dripping with texture and depth. They're filled with unforgettable sights, sounds and experiences, and all three were developed when no real template existed for player interaction within a large-scale, real-time 3D space. All three games stepped into this brave new world with surprisingly varied approaches, and each was successful in their own way. These were exciting and ambitious times indeed. The ageless, weightless spectre of Zelda 64 in particular had loomed large over the video game landscape for a number of years. This game seemed to be in development forever. Every month you'd see some sort of mini feature on the game, sometimes including one or two fuzzy screen grabs, and as time wore on, the game took on an almost mythical status. We all know that the game is an all-time great, and I'd argue that its mechanics, including the innovative Z-targeting system, have aged better in many ways than those of Mario 64. The game has a genuinely fairy tale quality, whereby very dark themes indeed lurk beneath the delightful childlike presentation and beautifully minimal and efficient storytelling. Panzer Dragoon Saga, released in the West at a time when the Saturn was for all intents and purposes dead, absolutely was the end of the road for this great console. The game features inspired and oblique world building and storytelling. Its incredible art design, flashes of iridescent colour and bizarre, grotesque and absolutely mental creature designs. The console went weak at the knees trying to render the vast, sweeping landscapes imagined by its director Yukio Futatsugi, and the game remains a truly unique and beguiling gaming masterpiece. I played the first disc of this back in the day, when it was included as a demo on the cover of Sega Saturn magazine, but I didn't actually pick up the full game until around 2010, when I happened across it in a Manchester City Centre second-hand electronic shop for the princely sum of £100. Yes, it's worth quite a bit more now. To me, this was a discovery worthy of some mammoth-scale Anglo-Saxon archaeological dig. I simply had to have it. I summoned my courage, handed over the money, proceeded to go and get myself a sandwich from the nearby Tesco Express, and promptly left the fucking thing behind on the self-service checkouts. Unexpected item in 
bagging area. A couple of minutes later, while striding down the high street with a nervous, excited, and somewhat smug look on my face, my bowels almost dropped right out of my arse when I realised what I'd done. I rushed back to the shop and inquired about it with a look of pallid, cold rolled steel dread on my face. And to my absolute delight, some complete legend of a man had taken the bag in the back room for safekeeping and promptly handed it back to me. If not for the fact that I wasn't gay or a woman, I could have had his babies. I'd argue that Shenmue shared many characteristics with Panzer Dragoon's saga, despite its relatively realistic setting. It too was an almost hopelessly quixotic project, and given their big budgets, particularly Shenmue, their dying platforms, and their unique, deeply imagined, yet highly esoteric content, it's almost impossible to imagine how they could have been successful. And yet, I love them both to death, and I wouldn't have it any other way. These games at once gave us a glimpse of fantastical possibilities and new horizons presented by rapidly advancing technology, and yet, taking a couple of steps back, they can also be seen as a last hurrah of the old ways of doing things. Now, don't get me wrong, I love modern gaming, and many things have improved in the intervening years, but the quantum leaps in technology and production values at this particular period of time, and the content of the games themselves of course, means that playing games like this upon their release was a trip the likes of which I probably won't have ever again. It's gone off. In the late 90s, Manchester the closest big city to me, changed dramatically. Having had a huge chunk of the city centre blown up by the IRA in 1996, the late 90s saw the first shoots of the modern glass and steel sea that exists today. The clean, shiny, affectless facade doesn't show any signs of stopping. For me, this process, as political philosopher John Gray puts it, the inexorable worldwide diffusion of new technologies that abolish or curtail time and distance first impressed itself upon me around this time. Crane by crane, LED monitor by Motorola clamshell phone, the world around me seemed to be morphing from filthy old brutalist concrete and decaying Victorian red brick wasteland to a giant, completely anonymous glass and steel airport uh, with a Lego store and a branch of Yo Sushi. This aesthetic seemed to be sweeping over the globe at this time, and of course, that encompassed consumer tech. <laughs> what a load of bollocks. In the coming years, we would see the Sega Dreamcast, and later the iPod, and the 360, and the iPhone, and you get the idea. One of the most important figures in this period, at least in terms of consumer electronics, was Joni Ive, Apple's British-American chief design officer at that time, responsible for the designs of the iMac, the iBook, the iPod, the iPhone, and of course the iDildo. 
His influences included the Bauhaus tradition, an influential art and design movement starting in 1919 in Weimar, Germany, and Dieter Rams, the chief designer at Braun from 1961 until 1995. With the iMac way back in 98, I think we can see a pretty clear demarcation point. Our favourite toys were beginning to look rather different, and I'd argue that the design of a great deal of today's consumer tech, at least in terms of their aesthetics, is largely a refinement of the stuff that was being released around this time. We were moving away from the dense, grungy, trancy sci-fi infused vibe of the early and mid 90s toward a cleaner, poppier, simpler, more spacious aesthetic. Now, the computer games war between Sega, Sony and Nintendo is hotting up with Sega's long-awaited Dreamcast launched in the UK last night. Many shops around the country opened their stores at midnight. You can see some of the shops there to cope with the demand and pre-sales. I'm here to tell us what's so special about this new games console and let us know what its competitors have in store is Chris Kane, editor of What PC Magazine. Hello, Chris. Hi. Well, those were extraordinary scenes in the shops, weren't they, really? They were. I mean, Why is everyone so excited? Because Dreamcast actually represents a whole new level of gaming for, um, for console gamers and anyone at home who likes games, really. Right, okay, so I mean, basically... Uh, 99 saw the release of the Sega Dreamcast in the West. And I'm going to put my todger on the chopping board here and suggest that the Dreamcast was the first modern console in the sense that many of its characteristics are still with us today in one form or another. Firstly, there's the light, floaty minimalism and pops of primary colour of the exterior itself, which contrasted pretty sharply with much of what had come before, at least in the West. And in fact, it doesn't look too out of place besides today's home consoles. Internally, the system moved away from the complex, bespoke hardware of the Saturn to a more standardized Windows CE powered architecture. It also featured internet access as an integral part of the package. For me, the look, feel, and design philosophy of the Dreamcast and its library of games are forever intertwined with the change in appearance of the built environment at that time. Take a look at issue zero of Sega Dreamcast magazine that I remember buying from Manchester Piccadilly train station as if it was yesterday. It was light, it was floaty, it was innovative, at times it was campy and kitsch, at times it was minimal and futuristic. Although it proved to be somewhat ahead of the curve, for me the Dreamcast represents something of a dividing line for home consoles. It was the beginning of the new. Soon, a lot more stuff will be white, a lot of stuff will be minimal, and a lot of stuff will be vaguely... Japanesey. Consoles would largely follow this pattern right up until today. The new was coming, and it was here to stay. <coughs> These days, we have a great deal of cosmically huge games with biblical budgets made by a small army of developers, oftentimes somewhat risk-averse projects that are simply too big to be allowed to fail. On the other hand, we have indie games made by talented micro-studios, many of them having paradoxically generic art and gameplay styles, mid-budget games of the type I've described are sadly few and far between these days, their presence began to shrink around the late PS2 era, coinciding with the dip in the output of Japanese developers moving into the 360 PS3 era. This was a damn shame, in my opinion, as personally, I think the most interesting and engaging of all video games came out of this particular bracket. Now at this point, I'm aware that this video is becoming the nonsensical rantings of a confused, almost middle-aged man. Only an absolute gonad would suggest that there aren't a myriad of great games being released today, and I don't for a minute want to suggest that everything's changed for the worst. However, I do still think that the late 90s was unique and exciting in many ways. Why, I hear you ask? Well, I think it's due largely to a specific set of circumstances that existed at that time. Is 
think we can do this? Later in the week. Tell you something about Harry Cole. The best bar none. I'll drink to that. The best what? The best bugger on the West Coast. In some ways, the era resembled that of the new Hollywood period of American cinema in the 60s and 70s, which, to massively oversimplify things, was a pretty unique set of conditions within which the studios of old Hollywood rapidly losing money and unsure how to react to the much changed audience demographic brought about by the baby boomer generation, gave lots of young, creative, talented folks large amounts of cash to make almost exactly what they wanted to make. In the late 90s, the gaming industry was quite different to that of today. Games were just beginning to receive larger budgets and to become greater in scope. However, the dev teams were still relatively small and they still had a lot of creative control, a relic of an earlier era. And also, mid-budget games had not yet been squeezed out of existence by the economic realities of a booming industry. Computing power was progressing at a rapid rate, and it had a seismic impact on real-time 3D graphics. Even a relatively tiny upgrade in power, the arrival of the PS1's monstrous 33.86 MHz processor, for example, opened the door to wholly new ways of interacting with our beloved virtual worlds. In line with Moore's law, just as they did in the 90s, computing power increases at an exponential rate. However, the vast leaps from one generation of console to the next simply doesn't exist anymore. And this is due largely to the cold, hard law of diminishing returns. Due to the sheer complexity of modern 3D graphics, a lot of folks now have to spend a comparatively vast amount of computational power just to lift a game from 1080p to a full 4K, and yet your game will look basically identical. In 1995, with a 30MHz or so jump in CPU power, amongst other factors of course, we jump from stuff that looked like this... The stuff that looked like this. <laughs> Complex real-time 3D graphics had only just become a reality and ways of interacting with these brave new worlds had yet to be codified. That led to a lot of strange, fascinating, and highly imaginative games. And a lot of shit ones too, of course. Today's publishers, on the other hand, know full well what genres and content will sell, what game styles will work, and naturally, they're keen on pumping out more of it, particularly when their budgets are so absolutely enormous that they can't be allowed to fail. Hindsight, the late 90s was most definitely a transitional period for video games. To paraphrase the writer Will Self, we live in an interregnum between cultural hegemonies, and in such times as Marx observed of political interregnums, the strangest of all forms will arise. 
Eventually, of course, there will come another technological leap when the gaming tectonic plates will shift again. I might well be old as fuck by that point, but I still can't wait to see what strange, wonderful, and frightening things it presents us with.